I put this here this morning so I wouldn't forget it. Kind of like when you put your keys somewhere so you don't forget them. And then I forgot it. So we want, also wanted, with the announcements this morning, we wanted to uh, uh, congratulate Ryan and Alyssa Carmichael, who were married yesterday in a private ceremony, or at a small ceremony at the Carmichael Farm. So news to everybody. So very, very cool to hear that this morning. So uh, they are gone to Eureka Springs this weekend, but as soon as they come back, make sure to see them and congratulate them. When I was growing up, there was probably no better, no, no bigger mountaintop moment than to be able to look in the eyes of another 12, 13-year-old young boy and just look at him and just say, I told you so. I mean, that was huge. That, that was a mountaintop moment to be able to, to be able to be the one, that at that moment, the one time that you are the Jedi, that you are the one that knew better than anybody else. It didn't matter if you were wrong a thousand times before. This was the moment. In May of 1998, Michael Jordan and uh, his Chicago Bulls were going against John Stockton and Carl Malone in this powerhouse of a team, the Utah Jazz. And the game had come down to the last seconds, and the Utah Jazz were winning, which is what you want. But there was enough time on the clock that all they had to do, because they had the ball, Utah, Utah Jazz had the ball. All they had to do was protect the ball, hold the ball, pass the ball, just keep the ball moving, and, and you win. You've done it. And Mike, at, the, at this point in his career, we are truly on a you know, first-name basis. But Jordan came behind Carl Malone, their, their, their all-star, and he steals the ball. And then, instead of just dashing down the court, he methodically makes his way down the court, setting things up, looking around, and then... As the clock ticks away, he rises up and shoots. And the Bulls win. And I, with Mike, raise our hands up in victory. And I look around the room and I'm telling everybody, I told you so. This was that moment. You know, the Apostle Mark in Matthew's letters that were read earlier, just, just a second ago also, you know, we see Jesus doing exactly what Jesus does. He, he's ministering. He's doing the, the work that his father had sent him to do, but this time it's different. You see, this time, Jesus is a risen Savior. He is the King of King. He is the resurrected Son of God. But why? I mean, why not just come back and say, I told you so, and then like Eli Elisha in the, in the Old Testament, be risen up into the heavens? Why, why not end it there with that great moment? But no, he sticks around. And he sticks around for not a few days, but for 40, maybe, maybe more. And he continues to do what he did before, and he continues to minister. He continues to train. But what's different? I mean, what, was it just proof? I mean, was it a, a continued, I told you so? Or once again, was it importance to be a, a minister? But what was it again, the opportunity to continue to instill faith and courage? You see, it wasn't an I told you so moment. This wasn't his moment. It was I don't forget what and why moment. Jesus returned because he knew his people would be struggling. The apostles had fled, right? This is where we see them at this point. They had scattered. Some had found themselves in a, in a home. And they're, and they're sitting there trying to figure out what to do. What's our next steps? I mean, they're bunkered down. They're thinking, what are we supposed to do? We had put everything in following him because he was going to conquer. He was going to become the new king. All the nations that we have been scared of will now scare us. We will be on top. And he goes into a tomb. They had fled. They're hiding. And Jesus returns to continue to minister. No matter their reluctance... No matter their disbelief, Jesus came again to follow the opportunities that were set before him. God has plans for everybody here today. We, we don't often see that. We don't often believe it. But all of us, the same plans that were set up for the first century Christians are the same plans that we have today. And God wants us to see it. He wants us to know it. God wants, us to, God wants to ignite our hearts. He wants to set us on fire. He wants us to become workers, to become missionaries. To use the gifts, the talents, and the abilities that we have. You know, we were designed by God to do good works. You know, we often forget that. We were designed to do ministry. That's what he called us to do. 
We were designed to be ministry. Did you know that? You know, that's something that I preach constantly, and I try to instill in others, and I try to remember myself to be ministry. I hope you believe it. Do you believe that you were made for more than just a, being a mom, being a dad, being a person of a career, being a grandpa, to be retired? Do you believe that, that you were more than just occupying space trying to get through this job so you can retire and then do something else and then make money? And do you believe you're, that the life is bigger than just that? Because that's the message that Christ came. God has a plan for his people. His plan was to prosper. It's to make your days and your months and your years bigger than just about you. It was bigger. It was always about ministry. Even as a return, the opportunity to minister. This morning, I want to look at two short stories. Ones that are very familiar to us. One of a woman that had nothing and owed everything. And another one of a young man who was ready and willing, though it made absolutely no sense to anybody else around him. If you have your Bible... Flip over to first or Second Kings. We will read a little bit. I didn't put it up on the uh, PowerPoint behind me. I'm sorry for that. But we'll read from Second Kings, and if you don't, you can follow along. And just listen. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, "Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves." Elisha replied. How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go, and ask all your neighbors for their empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut your doors behind you with your sons, pour the oil into all the jars, and as each one is filled, set it aside. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. And he replied, There's not a jar left. Then, then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell all the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. So often, other things get in the way and they rob us of the opportunities that we have in our lives. The opportunities that we can do good work. Christianity, to show our faith, to be able to allow God to work, to do things in us. There's so often this, that things come in and try to steal it. And God wants to take whatever we have, no matter what we think of it, and He wants to make it more. But He wants to make it abundantly more, amazingly more, incredibly more than we could ever imagine. That is the message of Christ. The more that surpasses all understanding and what we can comprehend more. God wants to take those talents. It doesn't matter if it's athletic, if it's intelligence. He wants to take all of the things you can, educators and mechanics, janitors. He wants you to use those things as well as the things that we don't have. He wants to take you where you are and what you're doing, no matter what it is. And he wants to create more. God wants you to see yourself where you are and all your success. And hear this, even more in your failures. And understand that there's more that can be done. You see, those failures are often the exact things that are your strength. I, I guarantee my strengths have been through my failures and through learning from other people's failures. But so often the devil says, mm-mm. -mm. Those are your weaknesses. And God says, no, I can do more. He just needs us to be willing. These are the remarkable, uh, this is a remarkable miracle. And it's even more profound because of the spiritual people that, that we are, that we're supposed to listen to. This, this wife who had lost her husband. And during their lives, they had accrued a lot of debt. We probably don't know a whole lot about that. And in, her, in itself, this is horrible to lose your husband. But they have no means. She has nothing. She's been left with no way to repay. And these circumstances couldn't be any worse, but the reality is, is just like today, there is this concept of restitution. And she owes. 
And we can even read it, I think it's over in Exodus, about the concept of restitution when, when someone dies. And that their children are able, able to be taken by the, the person that holds the debt, to be used as slaves. I mean, this is the worst of worst for this woman. She has nothing of her own to be able to now save her sons. So what does she do? She pleads. She goes to the one that she knows may have the answer. And she goes and pleads to Elisha for some relief of this situation. What should I do? What can I do? I could not imagine being in this woman's shoes. Everything has gone against her and nothing, nothing is going right. If you look at Elijah's response in that second verse, what do you have in your house? You know, it's funny because in, in some ways we kind of expect him to give a great answer here, but the reality is, is he starts off by saying, I don't know. And then he goes on to say, what do you have? Elijah wasn't going to fix the problem, but he did want her to see that she had the faith to be able to fix it. Her faith, her ability, not his. Her response was, I have nothing. And then to make her point, she said, I just have this jar of oil. She wasn't saying, I have this. She was saying it, this is all I have. Trying to make a, even more of a point that she has so little. But even then, Elijah was giving her directions just to make sure she knew. So Elijah takes what she has to offer. And he didn't try to make it more. This was on her. This was her. It had to be her faith. And even while Elijah was giving directions, I love this because if you follow kind of the conversation that they're having, if you follow that, Elijah, even, even during the conversation, he says, don't just ask for a few when you go around to all these homes. Don't, don't let the boys just bring back a few because he knew that we serve a God that if you bring back two, you're not looking for more. He's saying, go and gather get as many as possible and bring them and shut them and, and take them into your home. You know, oftentimes we find ourselves getting into a place in our lives where we too believe, like the widow, that we have nothing but. We look at ourselves and we think that we just have this to offer and really look at all these and they could offer and, and we start to compare and we start to feel less about ourselves. But the reality is, is that's nothing of biblical we often hear of all of the stories of those that were ready and willing, and they didn't look at themselves to see what they had. It's completely wrong. This is the devil. This is how he twists and turns, and this is how he deceives mankind. Is he makes you, when you walk out of here, to feel less. But the reality is, you're not less. You have everything you need. God says yes, and the devil keeps saying no, and then you've got to decide who you will listen to in all of your successes, and all of your failures. Once she was able to accept what she had to offer, and she had faith in what Elijah was saying, and faith in her God, she was ready to be filled. Not just those jars, but she. And this is where exactly where God desires to work. And those that are empty, and those that are ready, and those that are willing, ready to offer whatever they have, in any way they can, the emptier you are, the more you can be filled. That's a hard lesson to learn because when we think about the idea of being empty, it doesn't sound appealing at all. But God says, but what if I can fill you up with more of me than ever before, able to do far more than you could ever imagine, more selfless, more ready, more willing, more humble, more loving, more forgiving ready for God to come in and do those works. As long as there's something empty to be filled in that woman's, or some, a jar empty in that home, God filled it. They could have brought 10 more. He would have kept flowing. 20 more could have kept flowing. They could have just kept going and going and going. That's exactly why he said, don't skimp. Get what you can get. Because he trusted that God would provide. So often... Do we trust? Is that maybe why we don't want to serve? Maybe why we don't want to step up? Because the prophet was saying, if you will, he will. Hint, that's exactly why Elisha said it. Elisha trusted that God would provide, and he knew God would provide, because God has always provided. So it is with us. God seeks to use these vessels if we're able to empty ourselves, so long that he can continue to work. Graduates, 
I know you're scattered. I'm going to speak to you directly every once in a while, but please don't just hear graduates for everybody. You have so much to offer. You have so much to offer this world. You don't even realize. You, we spend so much of our time trying to, to do and create, but we have so much. And it's not just young adults going, as going into this new world and starting new careers, but as followers, but as ministers, as missionaries, ready and willing to wherever you are and whatever you do, be of Him. Do for Him. You have amazing talents and abilities. Your accomplishments and your failures both will speak volumes of who you are and the God that you serve. You know, this young shepherd boy, we won't read it for the sake of time, but David in 1 Samuel, one story that we all hear, we all know, we've, we've studied it, we've prayed about it, we, we've lived it in so many ways. But this young shepherd boy, you know, we, very, we truly don't know much about David at this time. Uh, we do know um, he was a young man of great courage. It speaks about his ability to shepherd. We do know he had great skill with a sling, which goes along with his courage that he needed to be able to stand out in the fields. But the reality is, is in many ways, this is what most young boys had. He was out there in the fields because his older brothers had graduated and were now part of the war, part of the, the army, part of the Israelite people that were fighting. So what makes David so different this day? The Israelite soldiers sat. They sat, waiting, not knowing for what, mostly out of fear, I'm sure, but they sat for 40 days as this Philistine giant, Goliath, came down and just walked around mocking, making a mockery of who they were and mockery of the God that they served. He just spent 40 days doing this, and not a single one of them would stand against him. It's crazy to think that this would go on for so long. How does it not one Israelite, not one, could do or say anything? Is David so awesome that everybody is waiting for him to arrive? Because he has so much amazing talent that maybe when David shows up, then, 40 days later, maybe then something will happen. No. We know the story. David didn't show up for any other reason. He was bringing food. When I teach this, I say, he's the pizza delivery guy. He's showing up because his mother said, take food. They needed it. They had spent so much time sitting and waiting for something to, to change. But David emptied himself that day. He made himself a vessel, which makes no sense to anybody else even his brothers and the ones that stood before him, but he allowed God to do more. You know, David looked at this situation in absurdity. You could hear it in his voice when he's speaking to his brothers and those that are around him. What are we doing? He wasn't the best with a sword. He wasn't the best with a spear. The reality is, the story even tells us he couldn't even hold up the shield. And as far as a specimen of a man, we know that he wasn't even a man. He didn't st stand any taller or any broader. Others, I'm sure, were far greater, ready and will, or not ready and willing, but bigger and stronger than he could ever be. But the difference was David already knew who would win this war. The reality is, is this, this story had been told to him as he was growing up. It was told to all of them as they were growing up. They already knew who won this war. It was told to them. This is part of their heritage, even before they knew it. And all the Philistine men had heard these stories, but David believed it. David believed it. So when he shows up and he sees all these men cowering, it's absurd to him. We know who wins. David says, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of armies of Israel, who have you defiled. You know, I know this is a story. And I know very often we go back to our younger days with the felt Goliath and Jesus on the board, and it becomes just kind of this fairy tale concept. But the reality is, this is battle. This, in, in, in all reality, this is a horrible time. This, this is death. This is destruction. These are people leaving their families never to see them again. And David stands up. 
and it makes no sense except to him because he knew the outcome. 1 Samuel 17.45, these are the words of an empty man. An empty man that was overflowing with God. He was an overflowing this day with the ability to know that he would stand because God had told him he could. David had emptied himself and he was using his talents not for himself this day. He would not win if it was up to him. But he did it trusting in God. David had emptied himself and he was using a courage to stand because he knew it was right and good. He was standing because he knew that God was in control. God, not he, was in control. For those heading off to college, once again, use your talents. Use your abilities. Use everything you have. Stand even when it makes absolutely no sense to stand. When it seems like everything is against you, stand. Fight when it already seems like you're going to lose before you even start to fight. Because you know the fight is right and you know the fight is good. This is what we learn from David. Fight. Jesus, fight as though Jesus himself was fighting beside you because he is. And for the rest of us, do the same. Fight. Stand. Do what's right. Even when it makes absolutely no sense to you and it seems like the sacrifices are too great, stand. Allow God to do in you what He can do. It doesn't matter your age. It does not matter your talent. It does not matter your gender. It does not matter your strengths. And it sure doesn't matter your weaknesses because God has proven He will use it. The key is to be willing. Stand up and live a life of faith, ministering to anyone and everyone that you come in contact with. And it doesn't matter if they've done horrible things to you or if they've even just forgot and put pickles on your cheeseburger and it annoyed you so bad. Be of God. Empty yourself and trust that God can and will and do the unimaginable. You know... I'll pause. I didn't write that in there. But could you imagine? I often say this to teens. What would tomorrow look like if we actually did what Tony said we should do every Sunday? What would our work and our homes, what would the dads and moms be like? What would the grandparents, what, what would our work situations be like? What, what if we actually listened to the words that God preaches through the men and women that he puts around us each and every day? What if, would anything change? You know, say that to a, a group of teens in a classroom and say, you know what, what if you went to school tomorrow and you actually decided to be Christian? Would, would anything be different? You know, this is a great movie, and I, man, I challenge you to watch it. Uh, parents with your, with your kids are retired. It doesn't really matter. It's a teen movie, but man, it's so good. It's called To Save a Life. And it's just, it's just a movie. But, but you see this, this young man who's, who's battling with the concept of Christianity. And he doesn't really know if he wants to, to, to do this, and I'm using his words, Christian thing. Because the reality is, is the way he sees it, it just isn't making any sense because Christians are supposed to do. And he's not seeing the doing. I know I'm using horrible grammar. There's a part in the movie, and man, it's powerful. It's powerful for me as a 43-year-old man. But this youth minister comes out after his class on Wednesday night, and he sees this teenager sitting in the back of his truck, just sitting there in the parking lot. And he says to him, he's asking him, why didn't come in? And he was just, he said, I, he basically just couldn't that night. And he, and he looks at the youth minister, and he says, if I do this thing, I don't just want to be like them. And I'm like... It's like he's getting it. He's realizing it. This is the moment. The moment where you realize God's at work. God's at work. And that the next day you'll be different. And the day after that, you'll continue and continue. You'll be empty and ready to be used. You know, I cannot thank these young men and women enough tonight 
uh, or this evening, or this afternoon that are graduating. I, I truly can't. Every year it's disheartening to lose your seniors, to lose your leaders, the ones that have grown up from Jason Brindley, who started in the youth group at third grade, I, believe, I think. She was hopping and ready to come in. We often found her in the back of the van and didn't know how she got there. <laughs> you know, I pray that you've preached sermons. I pray that you've preached sermons in how you lived and how you acted in the 13 years of your education. I pray that people have seen Christ in you. And even more, I pray that your lives going forward will be the same. They will be a testimony. They will be a ministry. And people will see you as missionaries on a task bigger than yourself. It doesn't matter if you become doctors and lawyers and janitors and the military. It doesn't matter where you go and what you do. The reality is, is you are first and foremost Christian doctor, Christian teacher, Christian military, Christian whatever. Keep that title and make it proud and live empty and ready. May all of us have the exact same lives. May we all seek every day to be Christian first and foremost and make sure that bleeds over and overflows into whoever and whatever we are in our lives. You know, this morning, maybe there's someone here, someone that's needing the love and support. And let me tell you, you're in the right spot. Brookline is truly a family of love and support, of grace and mercy that first and foremost wants to care and love if you are here this morning and you need that, I'm glad you're here. You know, maybe someone here this morning that needs the saving grace and the washing of sins and the waters of baptism that they've never received. And maybe you need to first, this day, like the teen in the back of that truck, decide for yourself, today is the day to be real, to be right. You know, maybe today is your day to live empty and ready to be filled for the very first time. I know that. I remember that feeling. May God continue to bless you seniors, wherever you may be scattered about. And may God continue to bless each one of us, and I say this very often, may we continue to learn to live giving the blessings that we are getting every day through our blessings from God. May we continue to bless others with our blessings. If there's anything we can do for you today, man, we would love for you to come in any way, shape, or form, and let us know what we can do for you this morning as we stand and sing.